I'm so glad that you have downloaded your workbook at melrobbins.com slash best year. And I am thrilled that you are sharing this episode with anybody that needs to tap into self-motivation. All right, let me just recap where we've been, okay? You've learned that motivation is just feeling like doing something. That's all that it is. We talked briefly about dopamine and the fact that dopamine is a part of motivation but it's really part of the craving cycle, that when you crave something, the dopamine effect is there, and that's what is driving the motivation for you to move toward it. But we are really focusing on what the heck do you do when you don't have the craving, when you don't feel motivated, when you don't feel like sitting down and cranking out a resume, when you don't wanna dive into your taxes or go out on another date or spend a Sunday night prepping healthy snacks for the week, ugh, or getting your desk or your closet organized, ugh, none of which anybody ever craves to do, which is why we don't do it, but you don't have to be stopped by that anymore, do you? Because you know that motivation is just a feeling and that there are gonna be things that you have to do in your life that you don't wanna do. And so now you know you're gonna to have to hack this thing, right? So step one, you gotta remind yourself, why does this matter to you? Even the stupid little stuff, why does it matter to you to do the dishes? I'll tell you why, because when I wake up in the morning and I walk into the kitchen and I want to have a nice cup of coffee and light my incense and start my day off right, you know what I don't wanna see? I don't wanna see a sink full of crusted, greasy, nasty ass dishes and pots from last night that are cold and gross. And I don't want to roll up my pajama sleeves and stick my hands into the soapy water and have to scrub that stuff off because you know what? I'm going to be mad. I'm going to be mad that I left it for myself. I'm going to be mad that nobody else did it. I'm going to be mad that I left yesterday's mess for myself first thing in the morning to clean up because that's a stupid way to start the morning. And I know that. So why is my why do the dishes at night? My why for doing the dishes after I cook is number one, because I want to set myself up for a great morning. Number two, I know that even though it doesn't feel easier, and even though I don't crave sticking my hands into the sink right now at night, I know that if I do it right now, I'm going to be better off. I know how good it feels when I'm done doing the dishes. And I know that a little push right now to get me to do the dang dishes and get it done and wipe down the counters and go to bed with a clean kitchen, that matters more to me than how I feel right now about not doing it. So I don't sit around and wait to crave. I don't sit around and wait to feel motivated. I push myself to do it because it matters. It matters. And here's step two. You ready? This is so simple. Let's just take a page from Nike, from the most powerful tagline on the planet of any brand anywhere. Just do it. Three words. Just do it. Do you know why that tagline is so powerful? I want you to stop and think about it. Just do it. I ask this question a lot when I'm giving a keynote speech and I'll stand in front of an audience of 10,000 people and say, in Nike's tagline, just do it. What do you think the single most important and powerful word of that tagline is? You know what everybody guess? Do. Do. And I don't blame them because I take an action first approach to life. But do is wrong. That's not the reason why that tagline is so powerful. You know what everybody guesses next when I tell them, nope, it's not do. It, it, you got to know what you want. That's true. That's true. You do need to know what you want because when you know what you want, you now can align your actions with it. But that's not why that tagline is powerful and I can prove it to you. Imagine if their tagline was just do it. Would that be that empowering? No. That's because the most powerful word in the entire tagline is just just is the universal moment of hesitation. It's that moment where you're standing on a sideline and you're thinking about whether you're going to jump into the game. You're thinking about 
whether or not you're going to do it. You're standing there because you're afraid or you feel unworthy or you feel like you might not be good enough to be in that game or now might not be the right time to jump into the game. See, all of those emotions that you feel, they don't motivate you. They drive you to hesitate because it's so easy, right, to stand on the sidelines and think about filling out applications or think about applying for that job or think about going out on another date. See, that's what Nike's referring to, how you and I sit in our heads and stand on the sidelines of life just waiting for inspiration or motivation to strike. That's why this tagline is so powerful, because Nike knows we are not motivated to do things that scare us. We are not motivated to step into the game. We are not motivated when it comes to doing things that feel a little scary, that feel like they might challenge us, that feel like we might not be good enough. That's why they're saying, just do it. They are calling you from the sidelines because guess what? There is greatness in you. Even when you don't feel like it, there is greatness for you to tap into. There is greatness that you can apply to this situation. So how the heck do you summon it? Just do it. Push through the hesitation because the power is in the action. Self-motivation means you understand what you need to do, why you need to do it, and you force yourself through the hesitation to do the thing you don't feel like doing, regardless of your emotions, despite the fact that you're not motivated. You do it because you know why this matters. And the reason why it matters is because Every time you push through that hesitation, every time you push through the lack of motivation, you tap into the greatness that is inside of you. You open the doors to a life that you're meant to lead. It's only through the action. And I've come to believe it's only through learning how to push through that moment of fear, that moment of hesitation, those moments when you don't feel like it. That's how you tap into the greatness. And there's one other thing I want to share to you in this regard of just do it. Because the other night I was out to dinner with our daughter Sawyer and her boyfriend Gavin, and they knew that Oakley had not gotten into his school and they were asking, you know, how he's feeling. And we were just talking about how hard it is. I mean, how hard it is to just pick yourself back up, especially when you didn't get what you worked for and put your best effort forward. Even though you feel like a loser, you feel like you failed, or you feel like, why bother? And Gavin was kind of reflecting on his kind of college process, and he had this really awesome philosophy. I'm going to steal this because I freaking love this. And it's something that he learned from his coach when he was playing D1 lacrosse, fail at full speed. In life, I want you to fail at full speed. If you're going to apply to a top school or to your dream job, or you're going to try to overcome your health challenges, I want you to know in your heart that you ran at that thing as hard as you freaking could. That if you wanted it, if you know why you wanted it, that you freaking attacked it, no matter how you feel in this moment that you don't let the temporary feelings stop you from giving your all when the moment matters. And you know what I also love about this? Well, first of all, I love no motivation required. It didn't say when you're motivated, make sure you fail full speed. No. Motivation is not part of this. It's 100% about who you are being. If you're going to fail at full speed, you're not going to wait around to feel motivated to do that. You're going to push yourself. That's, a, that's an ethos. That's a philosophy about how you attack the things that matter to you. I mean, don't you want to be that kind of person that gave it your all when it comes to the things that you really want in your life? I mean, I can't imagine any worse feeling than living with regret, knowing that you just gave up. You just said, uh, whatever. I don't feel like it. I know it matters to me. I'd, I'd be willing to live with this heartache for my whole life, knowing I didn't truly take my best shot 
rather than the heartbreak of going for it and being told no. I mean, wouldn't you rather fail at everything knowing that you tried as hard as you could? I would. I'd rather do that than be successful to everybody on the outside, but know deep on the inside, I cut corners, I cheated my way there, I didn't really earn it. And here's the thing. Fail at full speed. It's about putting your heart into something that matters to you, running at the ball. But I do want to add one caveat because I have said a lot in our conversations, especially recently, that you must slow down before you can step on the accelerator. Being clear about the direction that you're headed in, way more important than how fast you're going. There are so many people just running in circles, no idea where they're headed, going nowhere fast. So let me explain what full speed means. It means slowing down so you understand what you want and why. And once you figure out what you want and why you want it, it means giving it your very best effort. Whatever best means today. And there are going to be those days where you only have 20% to give or 30% to give or 40% to give. That was me for the past two months. I have been exhausted. I've worked way too much this year. But if 20% effort is everything that you've got today and you give 20%, that's 100% effort. That's full speed. That's what I'm talking about. I learned that from my friend and brain coach, Jim Quick, who appeared on this podcast about a month ago. And only you know how much you have to give today. And I love that. I love that because there are going to be times in your life where you just got 20% in the tank, but you're going to give it. And only you know how much you have to give. Only you know whether or not you're giving it your all. And you also know, by the way, when you're standing on the sidelines listening to the excuses. And so when it comes to self-motivation, just come back to this advice over and over and over again. These two simple steps are all you need to know. Seriously, anytime I find myself hesitating or feeling unmotivated, you know what I do? I remind myself why this matters. Doing the dishes. I don't feel like doing it for a minute. Why Why do I do the dishes? Okay, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. I'm going to push myself to do it. For the big things, for the little things, it will summon the exact clarity that you need. It will cut through the emotions of the moment and it will give you exactly what you need to do next. It works for me. I know it'll work for you. So stop waiting around to feel like it. Motivation is not coming. If it's not something you crave, dopamine is not going to help. And it doesn't matter because now you know the two simple steps and the truth about self-motivation. It is there for you if you understand what you want and you remind yourself of why you want it. And then you got to just do it. Use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, and push yourself through the excuse and take the action. Fail at full speed. And I have a feeling you're not going to fail at all. Hey, it's Mel. I want you to stop thinking about what you want and actually do something about it. What can you do? Jump into my new free training called Make It Happen. This training gives you the tools. It's packed with science. It comes with a free workbook. It's exactly what you need right now. More than half a million people are taking it. You have the power to change your life. Together, let's make it happen. All you got to do is click on the link in the caption, melrobbins.com slash make it happen. It's free. I created it for you. Why wouldn't you take it? Don't miss out on the life you could be living. Let's make it happen together. Let's just start with your concept that when it comes to getting things done, momentum is way more important than motivation. So research shows us that 
momentum builds once we start going. So in a lot of ways, we sit around waiting for motivation to do something when in reality, sometimes motivation precedes the action. Like you do something and then you feel that motivation. And the problem with motivation is twofold. You know, we talked last time about how if you're looking at your laundry and going, I don't want to do that. I don't understand why it's important. I don't care. I don't deserve clean laundry. That's a motivation problem. But if you're going, I wish I could get that laundry done, but I just feel frozen to my seat. That's a task initiation problem. And that's when you really want to focus on building momentum. Well, what do you want us to do instead? One of the things I like to say is that we can use 5% momentum to do 5% of the task instead of just waiting around for 100% momentum to do everything. And so thinking to yourself, you know, I don't have to do all the laundry, but I can fold one thing. I don't have to do all the dishes, but I can do two dishes. I can set a timer for five minutes and clean for five minutes. That makes perfect sense. But sometimes something that makes sense isn't so easily applied when you feel like shit. And so I want to dig into our listener questions so you can unpack this further, Casey, because I keep getting DMs and forms submitted at melrobbins.com slash podcast where people are writing in feeling overwhelmed and they're making themselves wrong for not feeling motivated. They're looking for motivation. For example, here are two questions from listeners who have recently written in. Here's the first one. Mel, I'm having that moment where I'm so overwhelmed. I can't get to anything. I've been laid off and it's been a couple of weeks, zero motivation. Or this one from another listener. After a bad re-breakup with my high school sweetheart of several years, I have lost all motivation to clean the house or take care of myself. Casey, what do you hear in these questions? I hear a couple of things. There's a difference between motivation and task initiation. So motivation is the awareness and, and the belief that an, a thing is worth doing and that you would like to do it or you would at least like the results of it so if you're looking at your laundry and you're going what's the point i don't even deserve clean clothes that's motivation issues hmm. or if you're looking at your laundry and going i don't care i don't i don't care about it like i literally like it literally doesn't bother me to wear dirty clothes that's a motivation issue and it's maybe maybe you could just wear i mean like who cares i'm not your judge right if you're going i am so so frozen I can't, I can't do it. I'm looking at my laundry going, I should do that. I've got to do that. I wish that was done. That's not motivation. What I hear is these people thinking to themselves, I'm not doing anything anymore. And what I'm hearing is they are doing something. They are processing emotionally a significant crisis in their life. And that takes emotional resources. And that takes cognitive resources. And you are not going to have enough resources sometimes to deal with that crisis and do your laundry. Like that is normal and human. It would be weird. You don't have an unlimited amount of cognitive resources every day. And if you are using a good portion of those, processing pain, caring for a child, processing a breakup, being in emotional pain, re-experiencing trauma, being terrified about how you're going to pay your bills. You are going to use up a lot of your cognitive emotional resources and those executive functioning tools, and you are going to struggle to do these other things. One of the things that I love saying to anybody and to myself when that happens in life and you feel paralyzed or profoundly overwhelmed or you're in a breakdown is the pile of laundry and the breakdown and the paralysis is a sign that you're mentally well. Yeah, like because that's your how body you're is to processing it. it. Yeah, you yeah. know, your body, you can't, of course you are breaking down. Of course, after a major breakup or getting laid off or losing somebody that you love, of course you're going to go through a period of time where you just don't have. The energy. I think the problem becomes and I th when that's your everyday life, where it's chronic. When and it's not functional. Yes, when it's not functional. Because you realize you would like to get to this stuff, but you can't even get to the beginning of the task. You're that depleted. Yeah. 
And, and when that happens, what do you recommend people do? So that's when we want to look first, we want to go into self-compassion immediately because we know from studies, shame is arresting, self-compassion is motivating. We see greater psychological functioning with people that can exercise self-compassion. So we get in that place where we're feeling frozen, we can't get things done. We want to first address, how am I speaking to myself about this? Am I saying I'm not doing anything? Well, is that true? It's not. I am doing something right now. I'm doing something very important. I'm listening to my body. I'm processing pain. I am being tender with myself. I am giving myself reasonable expectations. And you still deserve clean clothes. So that's when we want to look at some of these little mm -hmm. life hacks. That's when we want to look at good enough is perfect because the options aren't lay in bed all day or get up and do all of your laundry. What if the option was lay in bed for 10 hours today and then get up and launder one outfit? I love what you just said. So I want to take my little yellow highlighter and make sure that you listening heard exactly what Casey just said, because this is an important distinction. Shame causes paralysis. When you start to make yourself wrong and you feel paralyzed, you are likely in shame. Self-compassion, I'm allowed to be human. I'm doing exactly what I need to, which is processing all this emotion. A little bit later, maybe I can wash one outfit or I can throw some water on my face. But right now, I'm just going to give myself the rest that I need because I deserve to process this. That is a life-changing distinction. And you now know kind of the emotional feel of both. One is paralysis, that's shame, and that's the beat down. And we want you to get out of that cycle and to use this mantra. You talk about it a lot. I'm allowed to be human. I am. I'm allowed, I'm to, be allowed to be human. The only way that you're going to change how you are showing up in relationships to yourself and everybody else is to take care of it in the subconscious. 100%. How do we do that? Okay, so the first thing is we want to go back to the principles of repetition and emotion. That repetition emotion of us being able to first meet our needs, like we talked about, is a really important pillar of healing. The second thing is we can talk about a really simple tool to reprogram the core wounds. Which Let's is do called it. Auto suggestion. So basically, how auto suggestion works is the first thing, and I'll give a sort of a background story here first or context for it. But the first thing is we want to put ourselves in what we call a suggestible state. As somebody with a background in hypnosis, this is where this comes from. Suggestible state basically means that your brain is producing mostly alpha brain waves. And when you're in alpha brainwave state, you're a lot more suggestible, aka your subconscious mind is much more open to suggestion or to being reprogrammed. If you've ever seen somebody in an alpha state, it's often after a deep meditation, it's the first hour that they wake up in the morning, the last hour before they go to sleep, or if you've ever seen somebody when they're watching television and you're like, Bob, Bob, and like Bob's just like in the television, he's like in this sort of trance-like state. When we watch television, we actually produce a lot of alpha brain waves. So we get into a relaxed state. Easiest way is first thing in the morning when you okay, wake up. Okay, but can I just uh, make sure I understand? Yes. That when you first wake up, you are in the alpha state. Yes. But if you look at your phone, I'm assuming you will not <laughs> you be in your alpha state. You can take yourself out of it very quickly, okay. yes. Okay, so you're talking roll out of bed. Absolutely, And yes. immediately, the first thing you do so that you can take advantage of this alpha state in your brain, yes. where you're highly suggestible, which yes. means highly programmable, everybody, <laughs> what are we doing? So then what we do is we take our first core wound, okay? So the, the let's just use a really simple one for argument's sake. So let's say it's I'm not good enough. Okay, now, how the hell do we figure out our core wound? So remember the anxious prerequisite was like abandoned, alone, excluded, disliked, not good enough. So we mentioned gotcha. them all before. So hopefully people okay. recognize themselves in that attachment cell so okay. far. So, if you go, so the process is first, locate yourself in the attachment cell. Yes, yes. Second, really dig into what does the wound and... What is the wound for you and how is it showing up? Yes. And I mean, you can like, if you're not sure, you can ask yourself when I get triggered, what am I afraid the worst case scenario will be? Like you can think of times you were triggered and be like, what am I really afraid will happen next? And that's a way of kind of isolating it. But as a general rule, vast majority of people are like, I have the abandonment core wound and right. they feel it and they know. And so, so you can pick the one that's really bothering you the most. If we started with one for each, it would be abandonment for um, anxious attachment style. It would be um, betrayed for fearful avoidance, 
but also very strong secondary, um, uh, abandoned or trapped. Those also show up quite strongly. And dismissive avoidant would be I am defective. So like I am mm. shameful essentially. Gotcha. Okay. And, and so we pick the core wound that's bothering us the most. Then we oppose it. Okay. So what's the opposite of the core wound? Let's just use, I'm not good enough. I am good enough. Now here's the really interesting part. But what if you don't believe it? Like, you know it, what I mean? Like, really here's <laughs> the thing. Like, okay, well, if my core wound that's been in my subconscious for 50 years that runs on repeat, where I literally look in the mirror and go, that's a loser. That's the point, right? Is that your subconscious doesn't believe it. And, and so we have to address, like a lot of people will do affirmations. Affirmations are extremely limiting. I'm a big not believer in affirmations. Here's why. Your conscious mind speaks language. Your subconscious does not speak in language. If I say, do not, whatever you do, think of the pink elephant, you can't help it. Like you think of the pink elephant. Your conscious mind hears do not. Your subconscious mind do not is irrelevant. It just hears and sees pink elephant, right? So what we have to do is we have to understand the language our subconscious mind speaks, which is emotion and imagery. Huh. Okay. So we need to leverage emotion and imagery for reprogramming and we need to do it repetitively because the repetition is what fires and wires. So if you think of subconscious reprogramming, three simple ingredients, repetition, emotion, imagery, the more you have of all of it, the better and the faster it will work. Okay. So if we have, I am not good enough, we have to find emotion and imagery for I am good enough. So if you were to look for memories, okay. if I were to say, okay, tell me your favorite childhood experience and close your eyes for it, you would close your eyes and you would start talking about it and you would smile and you would actually see the memory in your mind's mm. eye. And the emotion is actually the container or the memory is the container for emotion there. So you would actually feel the emotion still in that memory and you would see the images. So what we do for auto suggestion, we get in that suggestible state, we get in that relaxed space. Then we say, okay, what's the opposite of my wound? I am not good enough. I am good enough. And then we find 10 pieces of evidence or memory for why we are good enough. So for example, it could be, I graduated from this school and we want to feel about it and see ourselves walking across the podium or, you know, getting our certificate. And as we do that, our diploma, and as we do that, we are actually using our conscious mind to speak to our subconscious mind hmm. and we are doing it repetitively. So we are firing and wiring new paradigms of how this works. And then we ideally want to divest, not, not feed into those old stories, those, those old narratives in the same way. But if we literally just do that 10 pieces of evidence in a suggestible state to oppose our core wound for 21 days, there are tremendous, tremendous results people will have. And they can actually drop these big core wounds that they've been carrying forever that are causing them in the first place to feel all that panic around abandonment or fearing to really rely on people or open up or fearing being trapped. Like we can let those things go once and for all. So given that you've done this with more than 31,000 people, what is the coaching that you have for somebody who is new to this and they're sitting there saying to themselves, well, I don't even know what an image would be of me being loved. You might, I'm sure this is the most common yes. objection you hear, which is I can't think of one. I, yes. So what advice or coaching do you have for the person listening that's like, okay, I get it. I'm going to bathe in this emotion and these visual images, but I can't even come up with one for I'm good enough or I'm lovable. How do you it's do this? a great this? question. And this is for sure, like you said, one of the biggest sort of points that people hit where, where they will feel stuck. So what we do is we start general and then get specific. So if somebody's not open to seeing that I am loved or I'm worthy of love, we start with things like it is possible to be worthy of love. And then we can even start as general as looking for other people who are similar to us or other people we know and how we may share characteristics. So we're just trying to, the really interesting part is that repetition and emotion will build momentum. So if we start with something that just feels like a little stretch outside of that subconscious comfort zone, because part of why we are also like, I have no idea is because because we have a comfort zone that's like, no, I am unloved. And I'm scared mm. to even believe that I could be loved because I every time I've hoped for that, it doesn't work. So our subconscious will try to like give us that pushback. And that's normal. For some people, it's they don't have much of it at all because they're open to the work and they're excited. For other people, there will be like a, a specific wound they get really stuck on. And so we start really general. So we would say something like, it is possible to be loved. And if you still don't feel resonance with that, we can say it is possible for all people to be loved and look for other evidence of other people you've seen with simil similar characteristics, build love, connect and people connect with people, create that loving relationship. And we can start there. And what we'll see is generally around day seven, 
people will start to have like a little bit of that resonance and feel good about it. And when we start feeling like, oh, okay, this is believable for me now. I can see myself coming into resonance. That's where we stretch again. We say, okay, it is possible for me to be loved, not just all people to be loved. And then we stretch again. And the other thing too is people don't have to come up with like 10 new things every day. We can hack this system. We can record it in our phone and we can just listen to it back and feel about it for 21 days if we want to shortcut and streamline the process. But it's just the repetition and emotion that we really need there with that imagery. I want to go um, a step deeper and make it even more tactical because I want you listening to try this. So if you're in the camp where you cannot come up with any emotion or imagery around I am lovable or I am loved or I'm capable of love or what was it that you said? I'm worthy of love. Yeah. All people are worthy of love. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you're in that camp of I'm, you know, I'm worthy of love, you can't even get that for yourself and you go, okay, I'll do the statement. Uh, it is possible that other people are capable of loving. Yeah. Do you then find eight sort of images could even be memes of people that are hugging or of people that are greeting their dog or of people that are buying somebody the coffee behind them in line, these kind of acts of love that you have seen other people do. And if you take those 10 and you either write them down every day and kind of visualize that moment, or you make a recording of yourself saying, here are 10 examples that love is possible, that people are capable of love or worthy of love. And then you describe them and you do that over and over and over when you start to feel the momentum then you say, you know what? It's I'm possible worthy. that I'm worthy of love. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And and actually, it's really interesting because the, there's three ways the subconscious mind gets programmed. So what we see repetitively or what's modeled to us, what we hear repetitively, and what our firsthand experiences are. So if we don't, if we can't find firsthand experiences, if we can't find times we heard something, then we can actually go and see like what's modeled around us, and just the exposure and proximity to that through repetition over time will absolutely do the trick. Thais, I just love that people can use that simple tool to begin to change their attachment style. And I also love knowing I can change my attachment style because what you're offering is not only this awesome framework, but you're also offering a simple way for any one of us to reprogram our subconscious mind. That is so cool. And I also want to thank you because you have put together a special bonus meditation for the listeners of the Mel Robbins podcast. And that is so generous of you. And let me just tell you a little bit about this meditation so you know what to expect. So Thais recorded this meditation as a gift to you. It is designed to be listened to 21 days in a row. And here's how you can find it. It's the very next episode of the Mel Robbins podcast. We also put a link in the show notes. But the title is this, Daily Meditation. Listen for 21 days to reprogram your subconscious. And again, it is already there waiting for you right after this episode. And it's designed to be listened to for 21 days in a row. It's one of the tools that Thais uses with her private clients. And it's something that you can use and share in your own life. Thais, can you just give the person listening a sense of the impact of this meditation? Yes. And so you can shed all the stuff we've been carrying for so long. I mean, sometimes we have all these like wounds and they show up everywhere and they interfere in so many different areas, but to actually drop them and to not have them that you, they're popping up and you have to cope all the time and backtrack and apologize, like to not live like that is very freeing. Amazing. Uh, Laura, who's an entrepreneur in Kansas city asks wellness and self-care are all over the place. As a driven entrepreneur, I have a hard time believing in anything but hard work and hitting goals. And that's just so I can grow my business. That said, I'm tired and feel signs of burning out from time to time. What self-care should I invest in? I don't have time for trips to the spa, let alone a vacation. <laughs> so <clears throat> I need you to hear me loud and clear. Wellness and self-care is a business strategy. This is so important because entrepreneurs in particular are horrible at life balance. And you know, I shouldn't even use that word life balance because 
there is really no balance. Like you're always going to be working because no one's going to care as much as your biz about your business as you. But here's what I want you to understand. And this was a huge wake up call for me. When you are constantly burning the candle at all ends, you're frying your nervous system. There is research from Dr. Judith Willis out of UCLA who studies the connection between a stressed out nervous system and brain functioning. When your nervous system is on edge because you're working all the time and everything's important because nothing is, and you think busyness is success and you think everything has to be done today and you are up until the wee hours and you have no life and you're constantly thinking and constantly on your phone, you are not able to tap in to the full capacity of executive functioning. Your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight, fight, flee, freeze, overworking, entrepreneurial nervous system, impairs your prefrontal cortex. So your speed of processing, your working memory, your clarity, your ability to engage in strategic thinking and decision-making, impaired. And I'm on a mission to get every entrepreneur and small business owner to understand that your nervous system regulation, meaning being able to have moments where you can take a breath, where you can drop into your body, where you're not on your phone, this isn't for wellness. This is so that your business is better. And it makes sense. Can you drive a car 24 hours a day? No, you'll fry the engine. You'll run out of gas. You're doing the same thing to yourself and it is killing your business. And one of the things that I've done in the last three years is when I read this research from Dr. Judith Willis, it was, you know, during the pandemic. And I realized I have since 2014 been sprinting and working 100 hour weeks and calling it success. And when I finally went, wait a minute, how could I possibly be the best I could be in this business if I never take a break? How could I possibly make good decisions if I'm running from this thing to this thing to this thing? How could I possibly innovate or be smarter about what I'm doing if I am always on my phone and always in the middle of a fire. The fact is you can't. And so this is not about self-care. This is about ritualizing in your daily routine the ability to take a pause, to step away, so that your freaking brain can help you. Because you're not helping your brain if you're operating like this. And the other thing that I can't stand is that we've sort of romanced this hustle culture, which might work for single guys, but it does not work for anybody with a family. It does not work for people that are taking care of kids. It does not work for most women. And if you're working all the time, you're not working smart. And so here's what I would say. Here's some things that I think you need to do. And this is not about a spa. It's not about a vacation. But if you think taking a vacation is a problem, that's a problem because you do need to step away. The research is also very clear that you'll come up with your best ideas when you are away from your business. You will come up with your best ideas when you're taking a bath. You'll come up with your best ideas when you're outside taking a walk without your phone so or without listening to anything in your ears. And so here's some simple things that I do that I see as not only self-care and wellness and for my health, but I see this as essential pieces of my business. So I wake up when the alarm rings and I roll out of bed. The phone is not near me. I do not look at my phone because this is zone one of the five zones of time. I walk into, or I make my bed. I always make my bed first thing in the morning because there's this momentum to just having it done I walk into the bathroom, I have 16 ounces of water, I keep a mason jar right there and I just drink 16 ounces of water. I look in the mirror, I high five myself into the day and then I get outside and I take a minimum of a 10 minute walk. And here's the thing about the walk. I walk like I'm light and if I remember to, I try to smile occasionally. Now the reason why I'm taking this walk 
I might have my phone in my fanny pack with my dog treats because I take my dog. And I literally walk down the driveway and walk back up. 10 minutes, walking like you're late. First of all, add years on your life. Secondly, it's a way to boost your mood. Third, you are getting exposure to bright light, which resets your circadian rhythms, which will help you with sleep. Hugely important, okay? Um, so 10 minutes, walk like you're late outside. That's my walk. I haven't looked at my phone yet. Really, really, really important. Next thing, I sit down and I just have a notebook and I just kind of free form dump my thoughts because I typically have all kinds of ideas that come yeah. while I'm outside. And also you're not listening to anything. You're not on the phone. You're not listening to a podcast. You're not looking at social media when you're walking. You are letting all five senses come alive. There's always some kinds of ideas. I write down all my ideas and then I pick the one thing that is my priority for the day. The one thing. That's it. That's it. Because I know that my whole day is going to go to responding to things, but there is one thing that I can inch forward, the progress principle, make 15 minutes of progress, right? Then I um, always send a quick text or video message to a friend or family member. That's changed loneliness for me. It's made me really proactive about friendships, which has been a game changer. And then I grab my hot 15. And when I grab my hot 15, hot 15 for me is 15 minutes making progress on something that matters. And then I'm allowed to look at email. And that's when zone two starts. And the only other variation on this is after my walk, if I do have time, that's when I'll get exercise in. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That, that right there is wellness. It's protecting my mind. And the other thing that has made a huge difference for me is prioritizing sleep. The more successful I get, the older I get, the earlier I go to bed because your sleep is not just about you resting. It is profoundly important for memory. It is profoundly important for your brain health. And it literally makes me better at the work that I do, and it sure as hell makes me more money. Mm. So you will make more money when you start to take your brain health and breaks from work and being smarter about time on and time off way more seriously. Yeah, I love the trade that you said earlier about trading some of your zone five for your zone one, which is, yeah. which is your time. Mm -hmm. Really, really awesome stuff. Self-care is a business strategy. Hey, it's Mel. And you know what? I want you to stop thinking about what you want and watching videos on YouTube and actually go out into your life and do something about it. Because action is the answer. And the first action you should take is jump into my brand new free training. It's called Make It Happen. This training gives you the tools to go from thinking to doing. It's packed with science. It comes with a free workbook. And it's exactly what you need right now. More than half a million people are taking it. And the fact is, you do have the power to change your life and I want to help you. All you have to do is click in the link in the caption or go to melrobbins.com slash make it happen. It's free. You jump right in. I'm going to be your coach. I created it for you. Why wouldn't you take this opportunity to make your life better? Go do it. Do not miss out on the life you could be living. Let's make it happen together. I've got another one um, from Maddie, and I know that you had um, some issues with binge eating when you were a teenager, and so I think you'll be in a very, um, you're in a really important position to make a difference here. Maddie writes, I'm 19 years old, and my social media feeds are filled with fitness influencers. I enjoy fitness a lot. I love the way the gym makes me feel and the reward of how my body can look, but I get too carried away with my image sometimes and let it control my day and my mood. I struggle with binge eating at night, but I haven't been diagnosed with an eating disorder. Do you have any tips for comparing myself to other people, comparing my body to other people's bodies? And even more importantly, how do I just build a better relationship with myself and my body? That is a very deep question and I absolutely can relate because when I was her age, I also struggled. And I think a lot of younger women struggle one of the things that younger women now that are up against that I didn't have and many of us didn't have is that social media has no rules. So the first thing that Maddie has to do is 
limit time on social media. And I mean really limit it to what is she trying to gain out of it. And this is going to take some internal fortitude because it is addictive and that is how these apps, which we all love, but are designed. And they allow for dopamine release and we wanna keep going back for more. I personally have a lock on my social media. I can spend 30 minutes a day on social media max until I'm locked out. And that is exactly what Maddie should do because comparison is a kiss of death for people. We have no idea what is happening. It really truly is about being one's best version of oneself and shifting away from the external. Again, this whole conversation hasn't been focused about the external drivers of, of looking good, mm -mm. but understanding that the better you treat yourself, we only have one body, the better an individual treats themselves from the inside, the more capable Maddie's going to be throughout her entire life. And ultimately, she's going to go through a period where, you know, each decade we compare less, right? Right, so right now, Maddie, you're at the height of comparison. And so that's true. Just also part of being a 19 year old woman, you know, a 19 year old girl is, is you are in the zone of comparison. But this is a, an amazing opportunity to develop some mental toughness. And what, what do I mean by developmental toughness? I mean, having a lot of discipline to say, you know what, I am not going to go and look at those things and compare whatever it is that those people are doing. And the other thing is I'm actually going to focus on a goal that I set for myself that is not external. It shouldn't be based on external looks. It could be based on so she said something very important. She said something about the progress in the gym, right? right? I don't see progress in the gym. Well, what about saying you are going to do 10 dead hang pull-ups? That has nothing to do with how you look. It purely has to do with embracing the discomfort of becoming more skilled at a movement. You know what? This actually points to the whole reason why I wanted to have you on. Because the reason why Maddie and just about everybody on the planet, particularly in that age group, has trouble with comparison is because they're focused on what they look like mm -hmm. versus being in the gym to take care of your muscular health. Being in the gym because of the different amino acids and the uh, way that your neurotransmitters and your thinking and your mood and your mental health are impacted. And one thing that helped me a lot, because I struggled, like everybody, with profound comparison, is if you're going to compare yourself, right? If you just have this habit of looking around and laser focusing in on the one person whose body type is exactly the opposite and genetically impossible for you to ever achieve, and then beating yourself up for the fact that you're not 11 feet tall or three feet tall or whatever it is that you wish that you were, if you're going to do that with one person, try for a day admiring everybody. Admire everybody in the gym. Admire the freckles on that person over there. Admire the curly hair on that person over there. Admire the monster calves that that person over there has. Admire the gap between the teeth of the other person over there. Find something that you admire that's unique about every person that you pass by, just, you know, casually, and you'll start to notice that you can flip it from this seeking of someone looks better than training yourself to see something unique and beautiful in everybody because we all look very different. And, you know, I think intellectually we know this, but that's a way to start to train your mind to default in a very different way. Casey, I am so glad you are here because, you know, I struggle with staying organized and not beating myself up over it. I pretty much have my shit together in so many areas of my life. Can you explain why it's so hard to just get the simple chores done around the house? So I think there's kind of four variables here. Okay. I think on a very basic level, um, there are emotional difficulties. Like we tend to moralize care tasks. You know, if we can't get the laundry done on time, if the dishes are in the sink, we tend to tell ourselves that that's about us failing. Mm. That's about us not being good enough. And that can really make it difficult to find motivation, to get on top of those tasks, to think of creative ways to help yourself. I think for some people, there's a physical aspect to it. 
you know, the disability is a very real variable in making some of those tasks difficult. And then of course, usually you have the emotional on top of it, right? It's hard for me to do this and therefore I must be failing. And then we have the mental aspect of it. I think that there's a lot of people when they're under stress, when they're in bereavement, when life is just hard, you know, we don't appreciate how complex our brain is when it does those little tasks and how our brain can go from doing things on autopilot to all of a sudden every step feels like you have to make yourself do it. Um, and I think on top, laying on top of all of that are just the societal messages that we have gotten about care tasks and about whose job it is to do those care tasks. What does it mean about the value of that labor to get those care tasks done? Um, you know, who should be above doing those types of tasks and whose job is it to do those tasks? Um, and I, so I think you run into a long history societally of, you know, what do we think about domestic labor and about women and about people um, of color? people of color and and how much should we have to pay for this kind of labor that we maybe don't see as valuable. Um, and so there's, there's, there's surprisingly quite a bit of racism and sexism involved in those societal messages. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, from my own personal experience, I just think about the fact that I grew up in a house where my dad worked out of the house and my mom was a stay at home mom for most of it. And she did everything around the house. And it got ingrained in me subconsciously that it's just my job and mm -hmm. that if I'm not able to do that job on top of every other job, then something must be wrong with me. How does that piece, the subconscious piece of what was modeled for you and what society tells you and the fact that, let's just face it, most dudes are not doing the same amount of work. The division of labor in a household is proven by research to not be equal between uh, people who identify as male and people who identify as female. Well, it's that same modeling. They saw their mother do it all and they saw their dad not do it. They saw the men, you know, get around the football game after Thanksgiving while the women went in the kitchen and cleaned the dishes. And so much of this domestic labor is invisible. You don't realize how much work has been done unless it's not done. Oh, that's so true. And I also think your point about morality, how does what you saw growing up or what society has sort of imprinted on all of us, how does that impact what you're talking about when there's moral weight to whether or not the dishes are done or the laundry is done or your house is clean or you got it all together? Well, you start to think, you know, my value, I think this especially happens for, for people who identify as women, my value is directly tied to my ability to pull this off. And mm. even in, in, you know, I consider myself a very progressive woman, a very feminist woman. I don't think my value is how good I am at laundry. But then it becomes something even more insidious, which is I should be able to have this career and not let my house fall to shit. That's what the that's what boss ladies do. And and, <laughs> and if I can't do that, you know, then I feel as though I'm failing. And then those old societal things that I didn't even think I believed about, well, if people come over, they're going to judge me for this house not being clean. I could not agree more. I am just like you in feeling like, okay, I'm a feminist, but, and I'm a girl, or, and I'm a badass boss lady, and I can do it all. But as I'm standing in the laundry room, and I see what is almost always a parade of piles on the floor, and I'm lucky enough that I've got a little room with a machine in it, I can do my laundry, I look at these piles on the floor. I look at the crisp white towels that I once bought at Target. And I say to myself, why are they blue? Mm. Why did somebody have to wash them with a pair of jeans? Why can't I stay on top of this? And I feel this level of overwhelm and failure that I don't want to feel. And so, and this is universal. Like I, I was so blown away by the number of people that poured into the DMs and the comments that listen to this show that are overwhelmed by the simplest tasks of keeping up with your stuff at home and taking care of yourself. And so aside from the bigger messaging, which I agree with you, 
how does that impact why it's so hard? And here we are 2023 where we're not only supposed to be on top of all the housework but most of us are also supposed to have jobs and have ambitions and be a girl boss and do all these things and it's it's just frankly too much for one person to handle but Mm. because of those societal messages coming to a head we have we have looked at care tasks as moral obligations that this is the sign of whether or not i'm a valid adult I'm a good mother, I'm a competent spouse, I have my stuff together, and we equate having our shit together with being a worthwhile human being, being deserving of love. You're right. I just thought I was disorganized. This is a crisis of how I am actually (laughs) showing up as a human being when I stare at these piles. It goes so much deeper which is why what I read over and over and over again in the DMs is this level of heaviness around doing household chores and taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So let's keep going even deeper. You talked about the fact that chores and other actions around your house, doing the dishes, keeping it tidy, cleaning the bathroom, taking out the trash, that these are morally neutral? What the hell does that mean? So most of us, you know, like you said, we look at the laundry, we walk by the dishes, and there's this message we give ourselves of, I'm really screwing up. I'm a failure. Like, worst case, I'm a failure. I don't deserve love. Best case, okay, see. Uh, I, uh, there's this this constant frustration and we feel as though they are truly reflections of our character as a person and and the biggest message that i have for people is that it is a morally neutral task mess is morally neutral dishes do not make meaning only people do and we are assigning that meaning that's coming from our head maybe it's our voice maybe it's someone in our lives voice that's kind of internalized but we're the one walking by the dishes and going look at what a failure i am it's true but i still don't quite get it because to me (laughs) when i see piles of dishes everywhere when i see parades of laundry when i can't get out of bed and on those mornings where I don't want to make my bed or I see the trash piling over or like this morning. This morning I went to make a cup of coffee and the milk was that kind of the the, the state of the milk in the carton was, you know, when you pick up a carton of milk and it's got maybe an inch and you Mm -hmm. kind of shake it and you're like, "Uh uh-oh, uh is that like is this gonna be okay and then you screw off the top and take a whiff and you're like this just turned so i can't even get it together to get to the store to get a gallon of milk so that i can have my coffee here and then i stand there and i'm like just what you said mel what the hell you can't even like get the fridge stocked you can't keep milk in place for yourself so you can have a cup of coffee for crying out loud yeah what is wrong with you yeah so the, so the meaning you mean, that though, you made moral, about because but isn't that true like isn't there something wrong with the fact that i can't keep the fridge stocked and i can't keep on top of the laundry like aren't i doing something wrong well that's the meaning that you made of it but let me ask you this mel like what else could it mean what else oh. could that pile of laundry mean it could mean that we've had non-stop visitors for the last 10 days. And um, there are people use a lot of towels. That's what that means. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of like a neutral neutral thing, right? Like, oh, we had visitors. That's certainly morally neutral. Did, let me tell you, what did you do with those visitors while they were here? Um, we hung out. We had a great time. We swam in the pond. We uh, watched the sunset. We ate great meals. We played cribbage. We went out to dinner. It was awesome. So you were you exercised hospitality. You prioritized those relationships while they were in your home. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, that laundry means something good about you. Oh, I love you already. This is good. Right? Like you prioritize something that I think if we were all just to look at the objectively is more important than than the laundry that day or however many days. Now, don't get me wrong. You still deserve clean clothes. So I'm not saying laundry doesn't matter. 
but it sounds like that mess in your home actually means really good things about you. It's true. So if somebody that's listening is like, well, I had no visitors and it's just piled up, like the kids' soccer stuff is piled up or my roommate's pile of laundry is in front of my pile of laundry or it's like now at the end of my bed because the uh, laundromat is down the street, how would you flip that for somebody listening? Well, it helps to think what would I say to a friend sometimes mm. in this case because what if what it means about you is that you're having a hard time? But don't don't people who are having a hard time deserve compassion? And aren't you also people? Like, does it have to mean it doesn't have we don't have, it's not toxic positivity it doesn't have to mean something great about you, although sometimes it does. Maybe right. it just means you're having a hard week. What what immediately occurred to me, Casey, is that I think it's easier for many of us to say you're a piece of shit or you can't deal than to drop deeper and be honest with yourself and admit that the pile of laundry at the end of your bed means you're just having a hard time. It's overwhelming at work. You've been fighting with your significant other. You are feeling a little lost. And that's what that pile of laundry represents, which is why it feels kind of scary on some level that it's gotten to this. Does and that it's make not sense? it's not an indictment though. You know what I mean? It's like I don't want to recognize that I'm having a hard time so that I can then feel bad about myself because we get into this rat race of self-improvement where my worthiness is tied to how self-improved I am. Like I must <laughs> optimize my mental health and my emotional health and my physical health and my nutrition and my my gut health like at all times, right? And the truth is is that the reason we pursue those things is because it it increases our quality of life. It's mm. not a, I'm more lovable when I'm on top of the laundry. I'm more lovable when I'm doing self-care. I'm like, for so many of us, self-care just becomes another thing that we can't get to, that we don't have the time for, that we don't have the energy for. And now we feel bad, great. And I can't even take care of myself right. What a piece of shit right. I am. Right, no, it's so true. And so how do you want all of us, and especially you listening to this conversation, to think about self-care, brushing your teeth, washing your face, resting, eating okay, being kind to yourself. How do you want us to think about self-care? Because you're right. So many of us, I know, I feel like I put my business first. I put my kids first. I put the dogs first. I put my husband first. I put everybody that works for me first. And I often don't do the things for me that I know that I need. And then I make myself wrong for not taking care of myself. Yeah. So how do you want us to think about taking care of ourselves? Well, I want us to bring it, it down to the very basics, like away from bubble baths and pedicures and yoga and things <laughs> like, and to the very basics of laundry, dishes, you know, a, a clear space to walk. Not that those things are a measured measure of whether you're failing or not, because yep. like we like we established, there will be days where the laundry means, oh, I must be having a hard time. And there'll be days when laundry means I'm nailing it today. I am actually prioritizing all the things that need to prioritize. So that's what we mean when we say the laundry itself, morally neutral. It could give you some information but it's it's morally neutral. There's nothing wrong with laundry. I, I would not be able to know whether you were feeling good or bad by looking at your laundry. So, but self-care at its core is about doing a task that cares for self. And we've gotten to a place where we see the dishes and the laundry, not only in service for other people, mm -hmm. like my job is just to do those things for the people in my home, but also as this external measurement for whether I'm measure, measuring up, as opposed to looking at the laundry and going, okay, it's been a busy week. I had friends. I loved that. I prioritized the right things. And I deserve clean clothes. And I deserve clean dishes to eat off of. And my kids deserve a clean place to play. And the beauty of that is that that does not require that you do all of your laundry or all of your dishes, or have a perfectly clean playroom. 
What does it mean? We want to get away from, is it clean enough? Is it perfect? Will better homes and gardens come take a picture of this? Will my mother-in-law judge me? And just, is it functional? Hmm. Because sometimes I'm in a place where there's a lot going on, good, bad, stressful, happy, and I can see I'm not going to have clean clothes if I don't do some laundry. And I can make the choice, okay, for the next two hours, I'm going to do all the laundry. Or I can make the choice, you know what, I'm going to wash and dry one outfit because I don't have the capacity to do anything else right now, but I do deserve clean clothes tomorrow. Or mm. I can go, you know what, I, I am uh, privileged enough to have the budget to ship this shit out this week. And there's nothing moral about that decision. I, that's what I should do because I hate doing laundry. And I, and I'm in a position finally at the age of 54 and working my tail off that I could probably drop things off at a laundromat and have somebody else do it. When I think about the topic of both authenticity and how to be your truest, most powerful self, this is so difficult for people. And I see it everywhere, this inability to stand in your power. I know so many people, and you listening to us may be one of them, that if you order coffee at a coffee shop and they get your order, your order wrong, you don't say something. Because you don't want to make waves. You don't want people to not like you. You don't want the person behind the counter to feel bad. You don't want to hold up the line. And there's an element of being able to stand in your power and ask for what you need that is part of being your truest, authentic self, correct? A thousand percent. And in fact, one of the things I can tell you based on my own journey, which is one that before those of you joining us today think that, oh, Rithu, you've always been this way. You always have, have known how to embrace your authenticity and, and claim your belonging. The answer to that is absolutely not. In fact, I have struggled. I struggled for decades to embrace who I am and be who I am. But as I learned to, to do my healing work and stand more, more in my power, what I realized is that every action, every micro behavior that I engage in is one step forward to me fully embracing who I am and claiming belonging for myself. And whether that is the barista at the coffee shop or the customer service person at the airport or the person on the phone um, for my internet problems, like it, or family members or my leader or my team members or my clients or my customers, like big stakes, there's the low stakes, big stakes. Every single act, every behavior I engage in is, an, is a chain reaction for me claiming my authenticity and belonging. And so, but it took me like Mel, it took me, years to finally make this happen for myself. How did you know that you weren't your authentic self? Because I, I asked that question, it may seem kind of dumb, but when we use the words authenticity and belonging, I think those are the kind of words that are intellectual. And so they, they, they without like a real life tangible example, it sort of floats over all of our heads. And so I want to start with the piece of authenticity and really help the person listening, understand what you're talking about and how you even know if you're your authentic self or not? Yeah, so it's such an important question. I'm gonna tell you a really quick story. I mentioned it in my new book, We've Got This, because it's a powerful example of how these moments can happen for us where when we're tuned in, we can clock the behavior. And I think being intentional and mindful and tuned in is critical, like self-reflection, self-awareness, huge. So just in a nutshell, uh, so I'm the child of immigrants from a very young age, I experienced relentless bullying, childhood bullying, and, and it was racist in particular. Plus I had cultural confusion based on how my parents were like, how white should we make her? How, how Indian should we push them to be? And so between the cultural confusion and the shielding myself from the hate and hurt coming my way as a kid because of being bullied, I learned to put on multiple masks and I, per I learned to push down my identities and I learned to curate what I call a performing self. And when I say performing self, I don't mean like high performance. I mean like 
Life is a stage. We're actors on the stage performing who we are as opposed to being who we are. I did this as a child to shield from hurt harm. I became a lawyer. I entered the legal profession. And as a young woman of color navigating the corporate world, I noticed that the messages around conformity were never direct like being bullied as a kid, but they were always there subtly. And so I became a master at shifting codes and and hiding, curating what I'll talk about at work and what I'll mask on and taking on the hobbies of like the corporate world that were like really popular and, and but I hated and I did all of this to fit in and I'm using air quotes for those listening and all not watching like fit in because I can tell you now that changing who we are masking aspects of our identity will never yield never be the same as actual belonging like yes some doors to acceptance will open but it's not the same as, okay. as actually belonging I want to I want to stop right there because I think that's part of the confusion for most of us yes where you innately whether it's because you want to have friends or you don't want to get picked on or you don't want to feel lonely or you want to climb the corporate ladder or you want to get a job innately we seek to fit in yes. and there are varying degrees to which we compromise our true selves you're talking about something I've never had to personally deal with as a white woman I've never had to do that code switching because of environments where it was all white because I, you know, blended into that area. I understand yeah. what you're talking about when it comes to the subconscious cues because as dumb as it sounds, I do remember being a corporate lawyer at a time where women didn't wear skirts. I mean, yeah. excuse me, where women that? didn't wear pants. And that is a, a very benign, <laughs> and superficial example of fitting in somewhere because I think I have to fit in in order to succeed. And yes. so everybody, regardless of your background, you have some example, whether it is deep around your identity, your race, your religion, your sexuality, your gender, right. or you have examples that are very superficial. Right. But what I really want you to explain for everybody right now is what's the difference between fitting into a group or a culture at work versus belonging to that group of friends or belonging to that team and that culture at work? It is entirely rooted in how you feel, Mel. You know, oftentimes we think that the mind goes first, but it's actually the body. Our body will signal to us how we're doing our, how we're experiencing a situation or a person before our mind even catches up. And so we want to, after today, start using our body as a guidepost for an anchor for how we're feeling. And so I define belonging really quickly as the profound feeling. So again, it's something in our body that says to us, I'm being honored and accepted for who I am. When we are experiencing belonging, we feel in flow, mm. like we feel at ease. We feel safe. It feels good. It feels nice. Even when it feels vulnerable, like even when we're feeling a bit nervous and activated because it's like, oh my gosh, I'm worried. What are you going to think and say? But I'm still going to share me and do me. It feels good. Whereas fitting in is activating. Like you'll, I often talk about when, when we feel the pressure to put on our performing self mask, and change the way we speak or hide aspects of our identity. Like for example, I experienced a lot of um, inequities and hate and hurt, hurt coming my way tied back to my race and intersectionality with being a girl, a smart girl or a uh, woman and coming from a immigrant child family upbringing. But people experience all kinds of judgment and bias tied back to, for example, mental health. Like Look at people's experiences with anxiety, depression, or you grew up poor, or you're the first person in your family to, to go to college or university, or, or some people feel like they're so short, tall, they're bigger. Like we are being judged. The, the fear of judgment and bias, like people actually judging us based on who we are, that's what strikes at our ability to belong. When we worry, based on my work and research, I can tell you, when we worry 
that you're going to judge me. You're going to take your love away from me. You're going to take opportunities away from me. That's what causes us to suppress our authenticity and it strikes at our belonging. Hmm. And so that's what pushes us to feel like I got to put this performing self mask on, curate who I am, change the way I speak, change what I talk about, change the way I dress, not tell you about my anxiety, depression, or who I really want to love or how I view my gender or how unwell my parents were or the, the really crappy neighborhood I grew up in, whatever the fear is. It's what causes us to curate and sanitize. And so we hide our emotions, we hide our behaviors. And we do this not because we're evil human beings trying to deceive others. We do this to shield and protect ourselves from judgment, which is one of the reasons, Mel, why I don't use the word inauthentic ever. I feel like the term inauthentic, like my first book, The Authenticity Principle, I, I wrote in it. The term inauthentic or inauthenticity in my view, has a lot of negative uh, connotations to it. It's, it's like you're deliberately trying to mislead people about who you are. My work in research has shown me, and I can tell you my per own personal experience, is that when we put on our performing self masks, we don't do it because we're trying to mislead people. We do it because of hurt and woundedness. Mm. We do it because of pain. We do it because we're afraid others will take their love away. And you know what? It's not a figment of our imagination. It's because people in the past have taken their love away from us and we worry it'll happen again. But as we do our healing work and we stand in our power, we start to realize a life that is created and rooted in belonging, where I feel in flow because I get to be who I am around you. Even if you'll judge me, I'm gonna do it anyways. <laughs> is so much more rich and beautiful than a life of literally walking around with that mask on all the time. And I can tell you, I'm not even effing joking because I did it for decades. This life that I'm leading, it's harder to live because it's more intentional and mindful, but it is so much more beautiful and worth it. I think one last thing I want to say to the men out there, any man who feels a sense of failure or that they haven't lived up to their own expectations or those outside of them. Any man who's been battling with or has battled with addiction or depression or any of these things that drag us down, mm. I strongly encourage you to start with you and to begin with forgiveness not always so easy but without a doubt I know from my experience not just me personally but being in the company of lots of men that we are all working our ass off to do the right thing And while we don't always believe that the results live up, it's in the forgiveness and the starting with yourself and the self-acknowledgement. And I want to go back to what you said in the very beginning, because I know that we're going to get a ton of questions, Chris. Well, how? How do I begin that? One step that you could take today is trying this habit of even just looking yourself in the mirror. Uh, I, I'm shocked that I'm even saying this, <laughs> given my initial reaction to the high five habit. But I agree. Start right there. Start in the mirror. Because if you change the story you're telling yourself about the person you see in the mirror, if you change the actions that you take in how you treat the human being in the mirror, if you change what you're thinking when you look in the eyes of the person in the mirror, 
that is the beginning of forgiving yourself. Like you will never forgive yourself if you if you refuse to look yourself in the eyes with compassion and with forgiveness and with understanding. And one of the reasons why I'm I'm going to keep hammering this everybody raise your hand and high five the mirror because if you're at a place where you are beating the shit out of yourself and you can't stand yourself for whatever reason, whatever you did, we've all done something, you don't have to change your thoughts. The neurobics and the science of simply making the physical gesture of the high five, Chris, and all of the lifetime of positive programming associated with it, it has a chemical, a neurological, a psychological benefit immediately that is grounded in science. And so the physical act does the work for you and it starts to plow new neural pathways and it releases dopamine, all of which will help you do the other work that you need to do to walk down the road of forgiving yourself. But if you, you got to start by simply looking at yourself in the eyes and seeing somebody who is worthy of forgiving because you are. Yeah, I, I can't stress that enough. You could you could forgive yourself all day long walking down the sidewalk, but it, it that's a that's a futile exercise. The mirror is where it happens. And seeing yourself. Hmm. It's one of the reasons why I always sign off the show by telling the person listening that I love you. I love that about how you sign off. And I know you mean it. I do mean it because um, I just know how many people can't look at themselves in the mirror. Like, it's just so sad. And I know how much self-judgment we all live with because I've lived with it. I was, I even learned that it's been 15 years today that you really struggled with loving yourself. And it breaks my heart. And it, it, it feels good to have somebody tell you that they love you and that you're proud of them. And uh, to some extent, unless you're willing to do the work on yourself, to let love in from yourself, to demonstrate encouragement, support, and love by looking at your eyes in the mirror or high-fiving yourself in the mirror, if you can't do that for yourself, you will never let the love in that is all around you from other people because you don't believe you're worthy of it and you're proving it based on your actions. What are you thinking about? Because I can see you getting moved. Well, I'm, I'm always moved by the way that you sign off and tell people I, I love you. And it, it ties back to what I was saying earlier is just my own experience in being in the company of men who don't, you know, they don't feel that. Hmm. Uh, and I guess since a lot of what I've been talking about is directed towards the guys, I would leave you with one last thought. And that is that while you're standing in front of that mirror and you're looking at yourself, you may feel alone, but you are not alone in either the struggle you have with forgiving yourself or the judgments or the failures or whatever that may be, you are not alone. At a really wild level, there's actually a human being in the mirror who needs you. It's the one person you spend your whole life with. And the moment that you can look them in the eyes and see a human being worth cheering for, you'll realize you aren't alone because you've got yourself. You know, I want to thank you, Chris. And thank you for speaking directly to men because, you know, everything that you're saying is universal. And I do think it's important, though, for men and boys and people who identify as male, that you hear a male voice saying these things. It is critical that other men realize that your emotional health, your sense of self-esteem, self-awareness, self-love, and going back to the very beginning of what I said at the beginning of, 
uh, this episode today is that I think we get self-love wrong, Chris, because we think love is a feeling. But the truth is, you only feel loved because of other people's actions. And when it comes to learning to love yourself, you have to start with the actions. Actions that demonstrate love. And when you are able to stand in front of a mirror and look yourself in the eyes, that's an act of love. When you're able to bring compassion and understanding to the person in the mirror and you see somebody that's trying and you see somebody that has regrets and you see somebody who still has an incredible life to live and is worthy of love, that's an act of love. When you raise your hand and high five yourself and the human being in the mirror, that's an act of love. And so I love what you said because so many of us know and wish that we felt better about ourselves. We wish we would stop beating the shit out of ourselves. We wish that we weren't in our own way. And all the research also shows that the most important habit that has the biggest impact on our lives is being kind to yourself. It's in the actions, everybody. And so I just love that you shared all that. And I love that you're here. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.